Omicron variant yesterday, which includes providing 500 million free at-home tests, more testing sites, and pop-up vaccination clinics. Joining us right now is Dr. Scott Gottlieb, the former FDA commissioner and a CNBC contributor who also serves on the boards of both Pfizer and Illumina. And Dr. Gottlieb, we were talking about this this morning amongst ourselves. Look, the idea of, of additional testing being made available is a great idea, but this isn't going to come until January, and that, that seems a bit late, and 500 million may sound like a lot of tests, but if we wanted to be testing everybody twice a week, which is what Europe's been doing for a while, we'd need 2.3 billion tests a month. So it seems like maybe it's a little too little too late. Well, it's too late for certain parts of the country. Certainly the tri-state region probably is going to be coming out of this epidemic wave of Omicron um, by mid-January. If you look at some of the modeling, other parts of the country will still be heating up. Uh, look, we should have been doing this all along. We should have been trying to get more at-home tests available and giving them away to consumers in, in drugstores, you know, allowing consumers to come into a drugstore, buy maybe four tests for $5, some, some small um, price, and limiting the number of sales that they can get, but making sure they got into the hands of consumers. That's what other countries are doing. They're subsidizing the test directly, allowing people to buy a certain allotment when they come into pharmacies. The other thing that we need to focus on is getting the monoclonal antibody drugs that we know still work against Omicron, the one from Veer Biotechnology and GSK, and also a second generation drug that Lilly has out to the marketplace. Doctors have become accustomed to prescribing these drugs as part of practice medicine now. Um, they're going to they're be looking towards these, and the ones that they've been using don't work anymore. The, the first generation drug from Lilly and the Regeneron drug do not appear to be effective enough against Omicron to be usable. Lilly has about 300,000 doses of that drug. It's cleared phase two studies. Um, it's waiting for marketing approval. It could could be granted an emergency use authorization to get that out into the market for high-risk patients. Again, doctors have become accustomed to using these drugs as a routine part of practice medicine in the setting of COVID. If they don't have these tools, that could be very difficult. Hey, Scott, here's, here's my frustration with this. We're almost two years in. You think that we would get better about predicting what we need next, making sure we're looking ahead at these things, speeding up the process for all of these things, recognizing we're still in a pandemic and kind of operating as such. And it, it doesn't feel like we've gotten all that much better at it, at it have we? I mean, I, I, I literally was talking about how I waited two hours outside um, in a parking lot last night to try and get a PCR test. It, not for me, for my kids, but... Look, these are the same discussions we were having in 2020. I remember writing op-ed articles right. about uh, the need to scale up the manufacturing of the monoclonal antibody drugs. Here we are again without sufficient supply on hand and also with testing, trying to get the rapid test out to consumers so they can do serial testing, which we know helps. We don't have the tools we have. Um, we know what we need to do. We haven't put in place the policy preparations. There's really no excuse for it. That's what I thought, too. Hey, we've heard uh, from Delta, the CEO there, saying that they would really like to see the requirement for people who are fully vaccinated, who test positive for for um, for COVID, assuming it must be Omicron, I guess, because it's more mild if they don't have symptoms, if it's not a big deal for them to be allowed to go back to work sooner, five days instead of 10, 10 days of quarantine, because they need the people to help and get through. I know that Dr. Anthony Fauci has talked about potentially cutting the quarantine time for medical professionals, for healthcare professionals, because of the need in the system. Delta is saying they need it too. Is this a good idea or not? Yeah, look, a lot of doctors are already doing this in their routine clinical practice. If you're asymptomatic for five days after a diagnosis of an infection, especially if you test negative on an antigen test, and the antigen test shouldn't be used in a binary fashion to tell whether you're infectious or not, but coupled with the other elements, um, someone who mounted mild symptoms, has resolved, is vaccinated, a lot of doctors are using five days as the period in which people can sort of re-enter work. Um, so I think it's I think it's a prudent thing to be looking at, especially for the healthcare system. But if you're going to apply it to medical workers, you should be looking at it across the board. Um, and this is in a setting of vaccinated individuals who we know typically resolve the infection sooner. My, my guess is that means one second, Andrew. Let me just follow up real quickly. I'm sorry. Uh, my guess is that would mean, as they've suggested, that people have to be fully masked and wearing real masks if they're coming back in in an environment like that, right? Right now, no. Um, people are being um, told they can come back into an environment five days after the resolution of symptoms, people who are fully vaccinated, especially after they test negative on an antigen test. I know that that's going on uh, in, in the real world. That's the kind of advice some physicians are giving to patients right now. So if the federal government stepped in to do this and changed the quarantine rules, look, some, some people can't do that because they're subject to these quarantine rules, but in settings where they have discretion, people have been doing that. So this would conform with what medical practice is veering towards.
Hey, Scott, I have a couple of questions. Uh, the first is uh, about a tweet that you sent out uh, just about an hour ago, uh, noting that there are uh, new COVID hospitalizations in London and New York uh, versus new cases. And what the big takeaway there is, I know we've thought that Omicron uh, is supposed to be more mild. Is this the issue of just now how many people have it? So we're going to get a bigger number. Do we think that Del this is Delta that's living alongside Omicron? What do we think is happening? Well, Delta is living alongside Omicron right now, and we, can, we haven't teased out which of the hospitalizations are a result of Omicron versus Delta, and we ought to do that to get a better window on what the true morbidity is from Omicron right now. And that may shift in the future as Omicron perhaps starts to crowd out um, Delta. The other thing we need to look at is not just hospitalizations, but length of stay, how many people are hospitalized in total, in aggregate, and also ICU admissions, because that's really where the healthcare system starts to get pressed. So we need to watch that very closely. We've seen a, a, a small uptick in hospitalizations. It's not clear whether that's the result of the Delta surge that a lot of cities were having, including New York and London, or it's an early indicator of rising Omicron infections winding up in a hospital. The other thing I would say is that we have way more Omicron infection right now than we're measuring. So if you actually look at this on an estimate of what the true number of infections are relative to the cases that are ending up in the hospital, the fraction may end up being much smaller than past waves of infection because we're missing a lot of infections. A lot of infections are mild or subclinical. We now have evidence of that from South Africa. A lot of people are turning over a positive diagnosis on an antigen test, and if they don't feel really sick, they're not getting a PCR test to confirm it, so it's not getting captured by the system. So there's way more infection happening, particularly in the tri-state region, than what we're measuring right now. And are you a believer that Omicron is crowding out Delta and that it effectively takes it over and effectively pushes it out for good or or not? Yeah, look, Delta infections will probably start to go down. But the question is whether Omicron is truly crowding out Delta, meaning it's providing baseline immunity that's preventing people from getting a Delta infection or Delta infections are going down because Delta on the whole is less contagious and people are taking more precautions in terms of their daily interactions. So that's going to be a very hard thing to tease apart. There is a, a thesis that Omicron won't crowd out Delta, that the two could co-circulate and Omicron will sweep through. But on the back end of this, Delta will remain the more persistent pathogen. The question is, which one's more innately transmissible? Is, is Omicron more innately transmissible in the Delta, or is it spreading more rapidly because it has immune evasion? And we don't really have a firm answer to that question yet. There's some preclinical data that suggests it's more innately transmissible, but that's not firm. And, and Scott, the other question I want to ask you about is we've been talking a lot about testing this morning, the government uh, supporting testing, subsidizing testing. There's a question about therapeutics and Pfizer, of course, which you're on the board of, has the single therapeutic, I think, at this point uh, that people are most optimistic about. The United States only has on order 10 million doses of this. Should the U.S. government go to Pfizer and say, perhaps even using the Defense Production Act, we need you to make 150 million doses of this. We need to have this on on offer and we need to force you to do it and we need to force you to do it at a lower price point. Well, Pfizer's committed to make 80 million doses next year. And just so you understand the situation, this is a protease inhibitor. The timeline to manufacture a single dose of a protease inhibitor is six to nine months. That's typical across the board. When you get the starting materials and you start manufacturing to the point at which you have a pill, is at least six months to nine months with a protease inhibitor. You're not going to get it down much more than that. The only reason we have the doses we have right now, Pfizer, and the doses coming online, is because back in July we voted as a board to allocate a billion dollars to start the manufacturing of this drug at risk. So we started making the drug before we even knew if it was going to work. That's a six-month timeline. Back in July we started that process. Now we have doses coming onto the market as a result of that. So if you want to actually put more resources into the manufacture of this drug today, to get more doses, you're looking at at least six months until those doses will come off the production line. And Pfizer is substantially ramping up the uh, infrastructure to produce this drug. Scott, yeah, you probably saw the, the comments from, from Bill Gates, I guess. Uh, what, what is the probability that, that he's right that we're entering the worst part of the pandemic because it's so contagious? That would assume that it that any of the mild cases we're seeing is because it's in, in people that have already had uh, vaccinations, and if it was unvaccinated, it could be uh, as deadly as Delta. Do, do, in, in your view, could the Omicron wave be the worst part of the pandemic? 
Well, look, we have a piece of evidence right now in the data out of South Africa, and they were probably diagnosing one in 20 to one in 30 cases, perhaps. They were not diagnosing a lot of cases because there was so much mild and asymptomatic infection, probably in that environment. That's my hunch. Um, and we didn't see extreme death and, and hospitalization that we've seen in past waves. I don't think it's just vaccination. I think the vaccines are providing a level of protection, um, but it's also prior uh, immunity. It's prior exposure to this infection. Probably 80 percent of the public in the United States, at least, has some form of immunity. And that's going to provide some baseline protection against severe disease. Now, that doesn't mean people aren't going to get very sick. There are vulnerable people that even with baseline immunity will still have bad outcomes. And there's people still who don't have baseline immunity, particularly young children who I'm worried about. But most of the population has some level of immunity and that's going to protect them from the worst outcomes to think, some degree. Do you think it's productive to make comment? I, and he's, I, here I thought he was, you know, climate change was, was his real expertise. No, I don't know. You can learn a lot from writing some code, well, apparently, uh, about vaccines, about climate change, about everything. But I, would you opine like that? Just blah, 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 out there and throw that out there? Look, I just don't agree. I, I just I mean, don't agree I, with I, it. Well, um, I, when when, when you look it? what's happened in other... Because it gets picked up and then, you know, that's, that's a horrific thought that this would be compared to what we went through in terms of 800,000 deaths and everything else. Uh, at this point, there's no reason to think that about Omicron unless you... I'm not sure what, why, why you would uh, posit that. Well, look, London's going to be predictive to the experience in the United States. We have, we have a similar complement of immunity to London. Um, but, you know, so far you haven't seen the, the kinds of spikes in people being hospitalized, ICU admissions. You're starting to see an uptick. And again, some of that is Delta because they were having a Delta wave. So this is going to press the healthcare system. And the places I worry about the most are places that are already pressed by Delta that have rising flu incidents. That describes a lot of New England. It describes upstate New York and parts of New York. It describes the Great Lakes region. If you look at the south where there's so far very little flu and, and they hadn't had a lot of Delta because they had cleared their delta wave they have hospital capacity to deal with this but not every part of the country uh, has that capacity that's where you need to be, be focused and worried hey doctor and finally israel announcing uh, that it is going to be pursuing a fourth uh, dose of the vaccine for those over 60 years old uh, do you think that's something we should be doing in the united states well, look, Israel's at least five months out from beginning their booster campaign. So they have a lot of elderly individuals who are probably coming up on six months. I do believe this is going to end up being an annual vaccine. I don't think that the uh, immunity that this confers is going to be durable in perpetuity. There'll be a baseline level of cellular immunity that will last a very long time. But in terms of protection against any infection and protection against mild disease, I think to sustain that, this is going to end up being an annual vaccination. Israel's made a decision in the setting of a pandemic probably to do it every six months until they get out of the pandemic phase of this. And I, I suspect they'll revert to uh, annual. Should the United States though do that? We're not, in a, we're not in the same position as them. Most people who've had their boosters had it in the last two or three months. I think as we're looking at six months, we're still in the middle of a pandemic. This is something that people are gonna have to evaluate public health officials. Certainly for immunocompromised patients, we're already doing that. I know some physicians are prescribing a fourth dose for people that they know won't have an effective immune response from vaccines because they're immunocompromised. Dr. Gottlieb, thank you. Merry Christmas if we don't Thanks see you before. Thank you. Thanks a lot. When we come back, we're going to take a look at what's ahead in the, for crypto in the coming year. Right now, though, as we head to a break, let's take a look at Black 